are listening to Reinvented. I'm your host, Jen Eckhart. Okay, when two-time Grammy Award-winning rock icon Billy Corgan, also known as the frontman of one of the most influential bands of all time, the Smashing Pumpkins, first appeared on the Reinvented podcast, you guys wanted more. Can you believe that, Billy? They wanted more of you. Well, guess what? You guys asked and we delivered. (laughs) Having sold over 30 million albums worldwide, William Patrick Corgan, the rock god himself, joins us live in person in studio here in Jupiter, Florida for part two, part dos. It's a Christmas miracle, y'all. It's a, a belated Christmas miracle, but hey, we'll take it. Billy, thank you for carving time out of your busy schedule to stop by to give the people what they want, which is more Billy. Am I supposed to respond to that? Or? Yeah, yeah. People people want more Billy. By the way, that would make a great t-shirt line, by the way. We want more Billy. <laughs> we could probably sell just as many with we want less Billy. Oh, Let's I see. disagree. I disagree. I the, the, put, the plus and the minus. Put me in touch with your merchandise guy. I have, s- right. I have some Danny ideas. Danny Deals of the NWA. That's our, that's our merch, Danny Deals. So, but seriously, this is a highly anticipated interview for a lot of my fans and your fans alike. You obviously have a lot more fans than I do. We even deck the room out in guitars in your honor, but people love seeing you, Billy, this sort of deeper, unscripted, <laughs> unfiltered, more intimate version of you. It's like you're like you're an onion, right? Like we're able to peel back the layers of Billy. That's another great shirt idea, by the way, like you as an onion. <laughs> Uh, and, Re- reinvented and onions make people cry and your slogan is who knew you were re- reinventing yourself as a merchandiser I well here we are first time for everything and yes. your slow isn't your business slogan sorrow is the family business yes my wife took it from a interview that I gave and she seized upon it as a marketable marketable entity so yeah actually our staff at Suzu's our cafe in Highland Park Illinois um, will wear sorrow is the family business I love it. shirts Okay, well, jokes aside, Billy, a lot has transpired since we last sat down to speak on camera back in October of 2022. I feel as though we've both lived like 100 lifetimes (laughs) since then. But, you know, what started as a simple podcast interview via Zoom back in 2022, interviewing one of my all-time musical heroes, transpired into an unexpected, beautiful friendship. And, you know, I've said this- Is that what we call this? I think so. What would you what would you call it? What would you label this? An association. An association. Oh, okay. He's now downgraded me. Okay. <laughs> well, well, maybe you, maybe you upgraded yourself from associate to to friend. You see. Okay. Okay. All right. We could talk about it at lunch. Okay. After, we'll after talk we... about it at our friend lunch after this. <laughs> you know, it's hard to capture in words alone what your music, what your friendship, what your support has meant to me. I've mentioned before that your music has gotten me through some of the most challenging, darkest days for me. I mean, you help so many people behind the scenes and have personally actually helped me navigate some traumas that I've experienced. What is it that drives your desire to want to pay? pay it forward to others? I don't think of it as a pay it forward thing. Um, I'm a Pisces by birth and also was raised a Catholic. And um, as somebody who believes in the power of um, Jesus Christ, and by extension, the idea of Christ, which, you know, comes from, uh, I believe the Greek etymology is uh, love. Christ basically means of love, I think. So fact check. Uh, <laughs> I think that... Um, I try to live life not so much against the way the world works, but more how I want the world to work. And so there's that saying that uh, you love how you want to be loved. And I wasn't loved in the way that I wanted to be loved when I was a child. So I think as I gain success and power by at least the Western version of the concept, it felt incumbent upon me to do something with that power there was pressure on me to be more charitable in public. I went through my own versions of that. And I found over time that I was most comfortable working very quietly behind the scenes with people that I knew, friends, in some cases, people I don't know. Um, through the years, people have always asked me what I would have done if I wasn't a rock star. And I always said a history teacher or a therapist. So I think... Um, You'd make a great one. I'm a decent therapist, I think. Um, 
<laughs> we won't get into why I won't make it, <laughs> wouldn't make a decent therapist, but um, yeah, I don't know. I feel very comfortable, I guess, in the rain, the realms of um, inner psychology. That's a lot of my work with music is about sort of exploring my own uh, inner stuff. And as I'm writing lyrics for a new Pumpkins record, I find myself thinking at times like, gee, I don't have anything to say. Like I've said it all a hundred times and haven't I written this love song before? And so kind of searching around in there, finding new things to talk about. Um, that's mostly what I'm interested in with human dynamics and psychology, which is why do we do what we do? And often why do we do what we do so unconsciously? Right. And why are we drawn to the same things again and again? Why are humans hardwired? to love, to, to self-destruction, to power, mm. um, both in terms of bootlicking subservience to power, but also they're willing to throw their own mother over a ship to gain power. Yeah. The stuff of movies, right? They always say there's only seven movie plots or something like that. So I'm very fascinated by that aspect of human psychology. And so as it demonstrates itself in my work, it's one thing, but then in life, I think... Um, I find it fascinating to find out what makes people tick. And of course, as it comes to you, there's a lot which, which makes you tick. Oh, there's a lot that <laughs> makes me tick, like a ticking time bomb. Well, there's that aspect right. of you too. There like is I'll the... go off at any minute. Okay, so I, I, I completely get what you're saying, by the way, and I appreciate your sentiment. I actually saw a quote the other day that says, I help people because I didn't get the help. I know what it's like to not have received the help. I know what Did it's like. Did I say like. that or you saw that? Uh, you kind of said that. Oh, like, I thought you were talking to someone I said, but you saw that. I, I no, else. I saw a. I, it was like a mm. meme, if you will. Mm. Is that what all the cool kids call it? A meme, a quote. You go, okay, a, a quote meme that says, "I go above and beyond the call of duty, and I help others and do unto others." you know, what hasn't been done to me because I know what it feels like to be lonely, to be isolated, mm. and to not have that sort of help. And I, I feel like you identify in that category. Well, there's the concept of Chiron, which is the wounded healer. And uh, astrologically speaking, I have a lot of stuff in Chiron. The concept of Chiron is that um, those that have been wounded make the best healers because they most understand the, the, the wounding. Right. So Makes whether or not that, had, that bears any uh, relation into my fascination with inner human psychology, <laughs> I can't say. But certainly the years uh, of my life between the ages of zero and um, sort of, say, 16 were pretty traumatic. Um, and I certainly examine and have examined my public behavior through the lens of trauma and how I expressed my inner trauma publicly, almost asking the world, like the world would care, to sort of uh, accommodate me for what I hadn't gotten in the, from yeah. my family. And so um, as I sort of have children now and I look back and scratch my head at many of my public antics, I realized that most of that came from an expression of trauma. And for people who've been traumatized, it's often very hard for them to understand that they trauma creates a kind of inner wounding patterning, uh, both physiologically and also behaviorally, that the very survival mechanism of the person will convince themselves that they're not reacting from trauma that's part of the survival mechanism like oh, i'm all good right. all good and so they're when they're acting out of trauma it's very hard to get them to stop and understand that that's what they're doing they're so convinced that their behavior their behavior is based from their instinct or their heart or their or that's the way i feel and so it's very hard to unwind the programming of trauma and get someone to look past their own sort of um i guess you would call it a weakness because ultimately it keeps them from being themselves authentically and um yeah so there's a lot of there's a lot of substantive stuff there to explore if you I want love, but i love that we're starting this interview off with trauma like first first up at that well you trauma. got me here to jupiter so that alone was traumatizing <laughs> oh my go please jupiter is great it's this lovely sleepy little beach town As you can see i'm dressed for the country club yes you are yes you are last time you appeared on the show we, you know, we were just talking about trauma. We did speak at great length about trauma, about addiction, both having lost many loved ones to the disease. You were pretty outspoken about having grown up in an abusive family. Uh, your father was a former heroin addict. Your father used to say to you, 
well, it's good you got abused as a child because it made you a better rock star. Yes, that's a quote. Which was so <laughs> cru- like soul crushing to hear. It's pretty funny if you think about it. But you often hear the phrase breaking generational curses. And, you know, the w- one of the main reasons I admire you so much, Billy, is because despite your abusive upbringing, despite the trauma, you were able to stave off addiction. I mean, conquer internal well, demons. let me stop you there. I don't think I staved off addiction. I think I staved off the the primary addictions that most people associate with being a musician. But it doesn't mean there weren't other addictions, including my need to consistently work. I get that. uh, Much to my detriment. So there was a story I told myself for many years, which is like, oh, I'm lucky I didn't get addicted to those things. But then ultimately I came to realize that I was addicted to other things that you could argue were just as uh, caustic to my life. Um, so yes, I mean, I was available to avoid, you know, stints and rehab and stuff like that. I guess my point is, is, you know, you were able to stave it off in a way so much so that your kids will not have to suffer the same way that you did. Like, do you feel that breaking generational chains is a real thing? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, there's the concept of sins of the father, which is that the, the things that the ancestors do, it sort of passes There's some theory, which is also that trauma is imprinted cell at the cellular level. So if you kind of do the quick unscientific math on it would be if your mother went through something very intense, it maybe was passed on to you genetically. So you might have inner uh, genetic trauma that isn't yours, Mm -hmm. but you're sort of wired that way. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting concept. Um, But I absolutely believe in the concept of of generational trauma. Um, I mean, much of what we were taught or not taught or we went through as children, my brother and I, I think was the result of what our parents had been taught or not taught. So just that's simple math, right? You know, um, even down to like the concept of like, yeah, I'm hitting you, but I'm hitting you less than I was hit. So this is better, mm. which is an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, and I heard that. That's not something I'm theorizing on. Mm. Um uh, the inner rationalizations of the family. Yeah, this family's messed up, but that's the way we roll. Mm. Um, yeah, of course, you know, half our family is dead, but, you know, that's because we're dangerous. You know, it's like weird, right. weird uh, coping. Right, like um, justifying. Yes. Um, without getting into the details, um, I once had a, a thing happen where I was talking to someone who was an intuitive, and they were talking about my mother's side of the family and I was trying to sort of put a circle I guess around why my mother's side of the family was not only overly sensitive but there was also a lot of mental illness in my mother's side Mm -hmm. of the family including with my mother Um, the intuitive said that 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 side of the family had been very um, not so much artists but artisans and at some point they were persecuted And so the family turned the persecution inward and blamed the sensitivity and the creativity of the family Mm. as the reason they were being persecuted. So take that as a conceptual thing to consider, um, and I'll apply it to myself. Um, You know, I I, I know people sort of bristle when artists talk like this, but um, I always laugh because I because I say if you're like a NBA basketball star, no one questions your ability to play at a high level. Well, I've played at a high level as a musician for 30 years, but in music terms, you're not supposed to talk about the fact that you're sort of, you're sort of at the head of a particular class, right? So for example, if anybody's accomplished at the top of their particular field, I think you can assume that there's some sort of causal effect, both genetically, life circumstance, inner character, that's delivered them not only into that place, but consistently allowed them to, to, to succeed in that position. So where am I going with this? So, uh, you know, there were indications as a child that I had some special gifts in life involving uh, music and or creativity. It eventually turned out to be uh, true. Um, the minute I poked my head up above that particular line, people started attacking me. Mm. The reason I'm saying all this is not to be uh, self-aggrandizing. The reason I'm saying this is because my first reaction to being attacked was to blame my creativity. Okay. 
Makes sense. That makes sense. Right. I started to blame the thing that made me attractive to people. Right. And I entered this very long, uh, not so much a problem anymore, but I entered this long sort of inner dissertation about how can the thing be a blessing and a curse. Right. And I think many people who, who have any kind of gift in life uh, certainly understand what it feels like to be put in this weird position where the, the good thing is a bad thing. Right. I guess that's a good segue for the next question I had, which was, well, like, what are some of the key things that allowed you to work through your childhood trauma? Like, was it intensive therapy? Was it shadow work? <laughs> was it crystals? Like, or did you just get totally lost in your craft? Like, what was it? All of the above. All of the above. I'm laughing not because um, you're asking me the question. I feel like... Um, like when I talk to Howard Stern, he always wants to talk about my childhood. So <laughs> it's like, I just feel, I sense, get this, uh, it's the performer in me. I feel, feel like, oh God, does he only talk about his childhood? So, um, but to be quick about it, I tend to think these days less about these ideas in terms of time. Meaning like, yes, there was a childhood and then there was the 20s. And I think it really doesn't matter. Mm. I, I don't know if that makes sense. What I'm saying is, I don't think the inner child goes away. I don't think the inner child stops wanting what the inner child wanted at four or eight. So you can you can find curatives which make the pain less, or you can find um, things that sort of allow you to organize your life better. And I'm not saying the scars can't heal and the wounds can't, stop festering. I'm saying that trauma remains a present memory. And so from a spiritual perspective, all you can do is turn that trauma into a memory without energetic uh, downside. It neither is a sort of a, uh, an icon on the wall, like, oh, here's that trauma or it becomes the story that you tell again and again. It just becomes a page in the book mm -hmm. of your life, and it has little emotional quality for you other than the regret that you went through something or the regret that your parents thought they were doing the right thing and they did the wrong thing. But you're able to drain it of its an emotional um, fixation on you. But that the, um, the key is not to turn it into something of the past, to turn everything into something of the present. I love that. You know, speaking of the present, as I've mentioned at the start of this interview, we both have lived like a hundred lifetimes, I feel like, since we last did our first interview together in 2022. You're now married to your longtime partner, Chloe Mendel. Congratulations, by the way. He's off the market. Um, you know, just one quick thing about the T word trauma, you know, but because I, I have to drill down on this. Because reinvented. I do think this is important because you've reinvented yourself. And, but what's important here is that you last shared on my show that you and Chloe sort of have a different uh, unconventional approach when it comes to parenting and that you don't shield your kids from all that comes with being a rock star, which I, which I love. Do you plan in time talking to your kids about your childhood trauma and the struggles you endured, or do you plan on taking a different approach with that? Uh, we do talk about it occasionally. Um, in fact, I was talking to my ch my son this morning about certain things that are sort of loosely related to what you asked. I think it's a kind of a dole it out where appropriate. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, for example, um, I told my story. Uh, I told my children some stories about where my father had uh, beaten my brother and I, and my kids, being kids, turned that into a story that my daddy was bad. Like what kids do, like like he's a villain in a superhero movie. Right. We were driving down the road one day, and, and my daughter started saying something about my father being bad or I, me not liking my father or something. And I said, no, no, I love my dad. I love my father. I think it's important that you try to give them a balanced sense of that, the conflict in that. Right. Um, right. That you give them... Um, as much as they're capable of understanding at the age of eight and five, let's call it the quantum aspect of like how you can both love and um, have issues with someone in your life. Right. 
um, that it's not so simple as dividing the world into good guys and bad guys. And, and as we often see in the political process here in 2024, it's good guys, bad guys, good girls, bad girls. And anybody who works in the world of entertainment, I would just say politics is a different form of entertainment. There are there Ooh, there well put there, there really aren't any good or bad. There's a lot. Of, there's a mixture of a lot of both. There's no bad guys in politics. What are you talking about? I, I've never heard of such a thing. I'm just saying is it's <laughs> it's a it's a human desire to want to put something in a box, and then once right. it's in the box, it's like okay, we can move on. And the sophisticated version of these things is to understand that life is complex, human dynamics are incredibly complex, and they're often situational um there's something i talk about where i'm not a fan of situational morality meaning like um oh i care about this thing hashtag you know da 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 but i don't care about the thing that's the same thing that's happening down the street from where Mm -hmm. i live because i'm attracted to this and this thing does something for me and over here i'm not so interested in these people right that drives me nuts so situational morality would be you would apply the same morality across everything and if you look at the way most people are manipulated at the mass psychosis level Mm -hmm. it's separating them from their own morality to to create a situational morality Mm. which is this thing is really super important you must focus on this thing all the cool kids are focusing Mm -hmm. on this that's how people get manipulated. Right. Another thing that drives me nuts is, you know, they always say when you give, give quietly. You don't necessarily need to, like, make a grand announcement about it on social media. I think, I think we've reached a point where there's a there's an axiom or a meme about everything. Yes. Yes. So, Agreed. So the, the chaos of, of human life in, in this century is that we've lost the sense of a moral absolute. Um, even in professional wrestling... Um, starting about 20 years ago, uh, fans stopped cheering for, let's call it the straight baby face. Mm -hmm. Eat your Wheaties, you know, eat your vitamins and, you know, help the old lady across the street type stuff. Right. They started cheering for the Mm anti-hero. And if you look at many movie characters, particularly male in the last 20 years, they're oftentimes ambiguously moral characters. Now, the movies are oftentimes a reflection of human society, but the point is is that as we've lost our sort of moral compass and we have no more moral absolutes, including what I call a post-truth world, which we've all lived in the last eight to ten years, if you don't know what truth is, if you don't know what a hero looks like, well, then everything's up for grabs. And then it becomes like almost like Orwellian reverse language, where good is bad and bad is good and you know, don't 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 look at the person behind the curtain. Um, so navigating that both as a as a public entity with you know business and artistic concerns, as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, um, I find that really challenging. And so the only thing that, I guess what I'm trying to say is the answer to every question you ask me is God, and I don't mean this God. I'm talking about this God, and and. You know, a lot of agnostic or atheist friends like to point out and say, well, how do you know? And I said, I don't really care. I don't really care. I don't need to know if there is or isn't a God. I'm right. okay with even just the concept of it to sort right. of orient me in a way that tells me that there is a better way to live and be. I love and that. if that is something that ends up on a tombstone, I don't really care. I'm more interested in how I live day to day on my own code, my own ethos. And that, that, inner faith in my own ability to orient myself as many times as I've failed has more to do with uh, a a moral and I would argue a Christian life than one of sort of trying to show off. It's funny you mention that because, you know, you always tell me, Jen, don't read the social media comments. Don't read the comments, Jen. But do I, do I say that? But I, I have to say, like, I sometimes read them, I guess because I find them intriguing or I appreciate the honest feedback. But, you know, now that I got you trapped here, I get to force you to sit here and listen to some of the comments from our last interview. Uh-oh. Are you ready for this? No, but I but listen, Billy... Is, this is one of them. Billy is so intelligent and open about coming through darkness to getting on the spiritual path that he's on today. 
I, this, this is one of my favorites. If Billy Corgan really cared what people thought about him or his music, there is no way I would be watching this at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. I only care about genuine people and genuine artists. Billy just happens to be both. I love Billy Corgan so much and the person he's become in the last one here. It's awesome that Billy has been through so much and he's still here making great music in 2022. That's just a cool thing. What is your real-time reaction to that feedback? I'm just thinking about the comment where they're like, I saw you and you only played five songs I know. <laughs> why were you dancing around the stage like a Muppet? It, it is nice to hear those things and, and to show you how consistent I am in that in that is is I'm surprised that people even thought that from our prior conversation so really that, sh- that shows you that I don't go looking I don't what are you talking about I'm like the Barbara Walters of podcasting what do you mean okay but what surprised? I'm saying is is that, is <laughs> I is that we did that interview and I know you told me personally that that you were happy with that people had watched it and uh, reacted positively to it but I had no concept of how positive how many people I have no, I don't pay any attention to any of that all I know is we had a good conversation and it, it didn't turn into a meme so that's a good thing <laughs> it generated a ton of positive press so much so that people wanted more of you and that's why we're sitting down doing a part two all right you know the Smashing Pumpkins announced that they're going on tour with Weezer this summer in the UK and Ireland so now I have and to Interpol and Interpol so now I have to travel overseas uh, well, I, UK, UK with Weezer and Ireland and Scotland, and then mainland Europe we're touring with. You have to, like keep track of all the countries yes. you're going to be in. But I have to travel overseas now. I've been all over Europe and to many countries, but for some reason I've never made it to Ireland. My ancestors are not pleased with me, but now I have like a perfect excuse to go back to the motherland. I once caught a drumstick. At a Weezer concert, their drum their drummer threw a stick out into the crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's no Jimmy Chamberlain stick, but it did make my high school self very happy. Did you ever have a teenage defining memory like that where like something really fucking cool happened to you and you were like, okay, I want to be that guy? Did that ever happen for you growing up? I saw um, Yngwie Malmsteen, the great guitar player, who was having a lot of success in the early 80s. Um, his, uh, I believe it was the Rising Force album, and uh, or maybe that was the name of the band, and the singer, uh, they had a they had a hit song at the, out at the time called "I Am a Viking," and the singer <laughs> Jeff Scott Soto um, had a big, robust kind of uh, rock voice, and I was standing in line outside the Aragon Ballroom circa 1983 um, during the daylight hours, waiting to go into the venue. And here came Jeff Scott Soto with two uh, really hot um, rock and roll groupies. Babes. They were okay. dressed like rock and roll groupies, so I will call them that. Do we still use the term groupies anymore? Is that And a he thing? had one on each arm. Okay. And he was coming down the line talking to fans. And I thought, oh, that's cool. And then I realized, that because he, he seemed to be lingering a lot longer than you would expect a star to. And then I realized he was selling backstage passes. Oh, Okay. Okay. And I thought, okay. Yeah. That's where I want to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the groupie or backstage? All of it. All of it. <laughs> to walk down the line, talk to the fans, hot girls, <laughs> selling backstage passes. I thought, wow, this guy's really got to go. Yeah. On. You want to be a salesman. I love it. I dig and it. Here I am just some schlub in the line. You're right. Exactly. You guys are headed on tour also with Green Day at the end of this year. I can't wait for that, by the way. Uh, Billy Joe just appeared on the Howard Stern show yesterday and made some news that he'll be performing Dookie and American Idiot. The album's in it's in, in their entirety, so people are sort of freaking out about that. But I thought, hey, to sort of maybe level the playing field here, perhaps like it would make sense for you to play Siamese Dream in its entirety. No? Yes? No? Okay. He wants to be coy with me. That's fine. You know, look, it's still insane to me that Siamese Dream just turned 30. I believe that was last year. Uh, yeah, we're, we're on our way to 31. I was crazy. Three. I was three when this record was released. It changed my life. I've told you this before. And look, still continues to stand the test of time. You have said in the past, you won't do a Siamese Dream Tour. No, no, we tried to. You tried to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, did, you, when did you try? Uh, when was we this? tried to at the end of last year, and it just didn't 
really end up working out. We had some dates on hold, and then it just ended up didn't work out for a variety of reasons. But we were going to do a small tour playing the songs, not just the album songs, but songs from that era. Do you think that's something you'll still consider? Uh, yeah, I think the... I think the general feeling is that people are less interested in that from us. I'm not saying from me, that people are less interested in that from us than just seeing us play, uh, let's call it the best of our 35 plus years of music. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Meaning, I'm not saying it's either or, I'm saying is I think it's situational and I think there would be times for us to play, so let's say the songs from that period. Um, versus say the best of um, but right now the general consensus seems to be that we're we're better off playing uh, putting our best foot forward including some of our, our recent material because it's done so well so obviously there's a compliment in that so I'm not disregarding it but I don't I, I would like to be in a band that is capable of doing all the things that I would like to do and it doesn't always work that way okay well maybe you'll make an exception for the what do you call us zombies Siamese Zombies. Siamese we did play zombies. an acoustic show on the anniversary, uh, at least to mark the anniversary, the day after I got married. At Madame Zuzu's. At Madame Zuzu's. That was incredible, by the way. You guys transformed your the vegan tea shop that you own, Madame Zuzu's in Highland Park, uh, Chicago, mm. into... A pop-up Tower Records. It, 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 incredible. And you mimicked the exact same set you played on the day of the album's release. Generally, yeah. The, I think we dropped one song and we added one song or something. But it was pretty much the same set in the same order. It was pretty cool. That's it was, such I a enjoyed cool it. Thing. And I, that's why I'm saying I would enjoy um, the opportunity to play uh, kind of a set built around the album. And let's call it an era specific set or something. Um, just waiting for those winds to shift. Well, we will be really happy. Speaking strictly as a Siamese dream zo walking zombie, zombie yes. from the dead, uh, we will be really happy when those winds You can, I, you can see him coming usually. <laughs> you know, Billy Joe of Green Day has been very critical of politicians in the past and even revised some existing hits to protest certain uh, political figures. Sure. Have you guys ever done that or has the Smashing Pumpkins sort of taken a different approach like leaving politics at the door? Uh, I can't think of any political song I've ever written. Um, but that said, I'm a political junkie. I play a ton of attention to politics. Um, and I'm not one of these people who thinks that... Um, politics doesn't have a place in music i think that every artist should express their views however they deem fit um whether or not those views are acceptable to people i think is irrelevant i think the artist should represent themselves however they should for for whatever reason i've just never been that intrigued to putting that type of messaging into my music yeah i like it separation of church and state you know speaking of green day american idiot was a massive hit on broadway broadway obviously a huge part of the entertainment business business being the key word here uh, when i worked at fox i actually did a lot of reporting on this topic i'm going to sound like a total show choir theater geek nerd loser who most definitely sang at carnegie hall by the way um but when you perform on Broadway, like you're, you're actually experiencing the pinnacle of like artistry in, in my view. And you know, your three act rock opera, um, your baby, this big body of work called autumn, like, where does that fall into line here? Like, do, will we see this massive body of work take stage at some point on Broadway? I would like to, um, at this point, I'd say it's not particularly realistic, but, um, I think the best pathway for the three rock opera things that I've written, Melancholy, Infinite Sadness, Machina, and Autumn, I think they're probably best developed as properties vis-a-vis -vis either uh, uh, graphic novels, novels, or um, animated uh, features or series or something like that. I think those things would have a better chance of being performed live going around the other way. The thing you hear in Broadway circles is, you know, you know, they call it the bridge and tunnel crowd, you know, the, mm. the crowd that comes over and that they need their kind of cheesy American version of things. Um, and I know there is a contingent of people who like their cheesy American stuff. Did um, you just point to me? I, I think you just pointed I to I me. I waved obliquely at you. Wow. Okay. Um, All right. Cheesy. 
I do love a good Phantom of the Opera. Like that's I, what, I have, I'm saying, Here I we have go. to, that's, that's, I have that's, to. That's, that's it, my point. You're the. It came out. It just came out of me naturally. But you know, I was once, uh, I was once offered to rewrite um, Jesus Christ Superstar. Really? Yes. Um, they 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 wanted to revive the property in the '90s. And they said, would you be willing to retool Jesus Christ Superstar for the stage? Basically kind of create a grunge Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> I kind of dig that, actually. And um, and uh, I listened to the whole record, and uh, uh, <laughs> I offended a few by coming back and saying, um, this music is awful and will not fly for the grunge generation, but if you, re- if you let me rewrite it, so it feels like an integral 90s grunge record. And they basically came back and said, go to hell something yeah. something i don't really say to go to hell that's that's not fair i shouldn't say things that people say uh it was something along the lines of like uh thanks but no thanks right right i get it okay but it was it was the cold thanks but no thanks it yeah, wasn't right, like right. let's keep talking about it it was like goodbye don't ever call us again even though they'd called me <laughs> i love it you know so okay there is a vacancy for Vanim of the opera just saying, whoever was at that theater before Smashing Pumpkins could maybe fill that void at some point. I, I, I'm just very realistic at this point. I think that um, there's the living band, which is the Smashing Pumpkins, our ability to go on tour and play big shows. And um, as long as this voice holds up, uh, sing those songs. And then I think there's the mythical side of the band, which I think will continue to grow with or without us. And... I think that the reality of what the band has created and or I have created over time will kick in over time. And more than likely, the the things that I would like to happen will, ha- will happen past my ability to do much about it personally. Um, and I think you do see that for certain musical works where the stature of the work grows over time, multi-generationally, where there's an intrigue that extends beyond the shelf life of the time. Much like Gershwin's songs were reappropriated by jazz musicians, stuff like that. I think you're going to see some of that from our, from our work. It's just our current American culture in particular is so divided. Um, I don't mean politically. I mean socially along lines of like, let's call it crass pop uh, panache and everybody else. Mm. And uh, yesterday I, was, um, I saw something online which sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole. And I went to a, the, the, the website of a, of, a, of a big music magazine and I was looking at their social media and their social media was almost all people with big social media accounts. Hmm. So basically this big music magazine no longer represents musical culture. They're like everybody else. They're just trying to pad their numbers. Right. They just want the followers. So they were they were they were constantly posting about musical artists who are not big musical artists but have huge social media followings. Mm. And that's not to disparage those artists because anybody who has stature has right. stature. It's to say that the musical economy has be, been completely subverted by the social order online to the point where it's really not even about music anymore. Right. It's just about generating attention, which right. are different things. Sometimes they go together. So my ability to generate attention <clears throat> remains. And, um, you know, there are many people who still like to write articles about me if I say anything negative or I get them a bunch of negative clicks, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that the band continues to build on a musical culture, which is far more important and far more significant, but that culture ignores it because it doesn't get them the kind of clicks that they want in that ecosystem. Right. And nobody has set up an alternate economy, which they should, which just positively wraps its arms around musical culture and celebrates musical culture for musical culture. Mm. And I think people would be able to build a business that would be just as big, if not bigger. But because they all live in kind of a fear-based economy on that side of the, mm-hmm. the street, they, they can't even wrap their heads around artists that have stature and carry on. Right. And, and you see the people that get rewarded on that side of the street are those who t- t- are willing to play the game politically, socially, say the right things, do the right things, because they know it'll get them economy in that world. So-and-so says this positive thing about this and gets clicks. It's not anything to do with their music. They pretend it does, but it's really about their ability to be used as useful idiots in a world that has a, an economy that has nothing to do with music. Mm-hmm. So everything you're asking about 
past work or Broadway and stuff like that ultimately comes down to whether or not somebody with money, not me, can convince those types of people to pay attention. And as the economy exists right now, the answer is no. Mm. And that's just because there's nothing there that they can wave a flag over. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. Mm -hmm. And we're living in this bifurcated society where there are things that have tremendous value to millions and millions of people that are being completely ignored by a culture that acts as gatekeeper right. for that, those types of cultures and if you actually look they're not paying anything they're not paying any attention to anything that actually truly matters right just clickbait well it's a different it's a sophisticated form of clickbait mm -hmm. um like recently we've seen a lot of people uh, dusting up about the nfl's embrace of taylor swift because of her dating the tight end and the whole thing right you see the clash of two cultures mm -hmm. and in Taylor Swift's case, she's at the very top of her musical culture. Right. And in the case of the NFL, there's no bigger business in terms of sports except maybe F1. But for Americans, I mean, the NFL is supreme. Right. right. They cannot resist the temptation to talk about this, this coupling. Yeah. Because there's so much in it for them, for the, the thing that they're after. Right. But if you look at what it's really about, it has very little to do with music and it has very little to do with football. Getting all those Swifties to tune in for ratings. I think it's I think it's even more crass than that. I and think it's I, I think it's 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 what I'm trying to talk about, which is this is kind of a this is like a parallel economy that runs alongside things that actually okay people actually play football games. Mm -hmm. Taylor Swift goes out and fills stadiums full of people and sells gazillions of records. Those are real things. Mm -hmm. So somebody sets up a parallel economy and goes, if I talk junk about this and what cookie he ate, I can use that to create influence for myself. Right. And so what I'm talking about is the hijacking of culture that actually has relevance, musical culture, sports culture, being hijacked by a different culture that ultimately kind of has some sort of say in how it all goes because it creates economy which feeds into the worst of human behavior and is able to mine that. And it's certainly using AI. Yeah. As some, and it's only going to get worse and not going to get better using these kind of AI things to figure out people are really fascinated with this aspect of it. So it's really hard to talk about integral things. And now my wrote things that the band has done and continue to do that have relevance against a world, which is creating basically seppuku, the that's Broadway, an, that's the, broad, an SAT the word. Broadway, the Broadway okay. world over time, the the um, the classical world over time has created various forms of seppuku because they they end up in 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 increasingly small cultures which become more and more pernicious, less outreach to a community that actually wants to be outraged mm -hmm. to, and then they have serving masters that don't care about their cultures at all, right? Because it's the cheap economy of getting attention, right? And this is the drain that American culture is going down. Everybody watches it and doesn't know what to do. I'm just stri strictly pointing out that as somebody who actually lives it, I don't play along with it. I don't have any interest in it because ultimately it's counter spiritual. But that's why people love you because you're an <laughs> because you're an outlier. You're sort of this misfit who does. I actually don't think I'm that much of an outlier. I think I'm like a lot of people who just want to have a good life and have a good time and, and do good things in the world and um, and don't really, really care who won this or didn't win that and all that type of stuff. Yeah. You know, Green Day, I love seeing Green Day and the Smashing Pumpkins go on tour together because there's a lot of people out there, assholes mostly, who like to categorize you and put you guys in this like 90s has been box when you guys are quite literally out there proving the exact opposite, as you said, like still out there, still crushing it, still making new music, still selling out tours worldwide. I thought we were only reading the positive comments from the fans. <laughs> Let, give him the microphone. He can host the show and he can answer the questions. He I can do it I, all. I, I'll tell you what, me interviewing <laughs> you would get a big rating. Prob probably. Maybe we can do that. We can do that one time. We can do that. We get down to what makes this person really tick. <laughs> See? All right, Billy. Okay. We got, we got it. Are we you got blushing? It. A little bit, a little bit. Okay. 
Back to guitars, shifting gears. It is no secret that the Smashing Pumpkins, your band, is soliciting for a new guitarist, but you're doing something a bit unconventional. You're putting sort of this call out into the world to fill this vacancy. It's funny, a friend of mine, Billy, who has been playing the guitar since November of 2022, called me and he was like, so like, you think this is like... You think this is my chance? <laughs> it was like in Dumber, Dumb and Dumber Lloyd when he's like, so you're saying there is a chance. Yeah, I was like, I was like, bro, I don't, I don't think this is your gig, but like, eh, you know, like look, I had to let him down easy, but I'm curious, why did you choose this alternative route to seeking a guitarist when you're already so switched into the music community? Um, not as, uh, tied into music community as you would think um certainly not living in new york or la as part of that um we had um been fielding uh, inquiries privately um once uh, jeff schroeder our former guitar player left and publicly left you know put out a statement and the whole thing um but the list of people who had actually reached out was quite small which told me uh not so much that people weren't interested because I knew that they would be. It's that the word hadn't got gotten out that we were looking for somebody or that we would necessarily uh, replace uh, Jeff's position on stage. So I thought, okay, well, let's just put this out and see what happens. And the reaction was immediately immediate. And I think we're over 10,000 submissions at this point. Wow. 10,000. As we speak here on the, uh, on the reinvented podcast, um, there's eight people working full time, to go through all the submissions working overtime you're running a sweatshop over there well, wow I, I think it's fair if you're going to say we're open to anybody yeah. that you give everybody the opportunity to make their case yeah um and so yeah th so those are being kind of sifted into piles and uh I think of like when normal people like us who aren't Grammy award winning rock stars, like when we apply for jobs, we go on like indeed.com and like upload our resume. But like, how does that, how does that process work exactly? Like does one submit an audition tape? How does it, how we does it work? Uh, we didn't, uh, people could submit whatever they want. I mean, there are people <laughs> who are literally writing, I'm 16 years old and I just started picking up the guitar and I'd love oh, to be the guitar player. That's so cute. Um, and there are people, you know, Hey, I've, toured for 37 years and I played with these people and here's some YouTube clips of me playing and here's a song that I wrote and I think you leave it up to them to sort of make their case. Um, I did notice though that you are not soliciting for a triangle player, for uh, a tambourine player, for the cowbell. You know, I can go on and on. I hate to embarrass you. <laughs> no, you don't. You love embarrassing but me. This is the joke that everyone who doesn't play makes with the band. Oh, you that's what they do. They like, go, oh, I'll play the triangle. Yes. Okay. Well, just letting you know my schedule is totally open. <laughs> if you do end up, if you if you need. As I always tell musicians, you really don't want to work for me. Oh, okay. My Maybe reputation not. definitely precedes me there. Well, it seems. Um, because musicians talk about the, the look. The look? But yeah. Apparently, Benny Goodman did the same thing. He, had, he was famously. Where known. he could just talk with his eyes. Um, the, the one musician I talked to once, I said, can you explain the look to me? And they said, we'll be in the middle of a show and you'll whirl around and you'll look at me and, and give me this look. And I was like, okay, but what does the look say? And they said, um, the look says to me, I can't believe in a million years that you thought that was the note that you should have played in that particular moment. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's fair, fair oh, enough. I love that. I love that. I was in a similar situation as a journalist. I was in, at a sit down shoot with Warren Buffett and it, you know, we had to set up the cameras. It was a three camera shot. And, um, one of the cameramen decided to take away a camera and just make it a two shot instead of a three shot. And the anchor looked at me, I was producing the segment at the time, the look, and was just like, why would you ever allow something like this to happen? So like when you get the look, you you know it, you know, yeah, yeah. you so know I, it's I, the look. I, I, I am known for shooting the look. Um, wow, dagger eyes. Um, you know, it seems everyone, at least on my social media feed, is talking about the Las Vegas sphere. It's this big circular it's basically they're calling it the future of concert going it's like this new revolutionary venue to watch 
enjoy like immersive shows, concerts, mm-hmm. events, like never before. You two actually has a residency there now in Vegas. What is your take on the sphere? Have you seen videos of it? Do you find it cheesy? Are you into it? Uh, I think anything that uh, changes the way concerts are performed is a good thing. They haven't really changed much in the last 60 or 70 years. Good. Um, I think the, the the amount of investment that they put in to build that thing and create an attraction in Vegas, that's a good thing as well. And obviously they got you two to step up to the plate and launch the thing. The difficulty from, from uh, our vantage point, and I think many artists would be even if they came to you and asked the amount of production necessary to put together a show that meets the capability of the sphere is, is prohibitive. So is, is it going to be a thing where, um, just quick economy, are they going to build 10 spheres around the globe? And then once a band like U2 puts it together, that show, they basically go around and plant themselves Mm. in Dubai for a month in London for a month in, Stockholm for a month, right? And so it becomes a venue that's only for the top, top artists in the world. And by top, I mean the top, top. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there's a lot of artists that would say be beneath that level, in our case, that would go to arenas. Can you draw enough people to go there and play for a residency? So I know, I, I know, Fish is coming in there next. They are. If the Smashing Pumpkins <laughs> though was offered a residency, would you consider? Oh, I do in a second. It's not. I'm, I'm, I'm just letting people know that it's this fantastical thing. But the cost of being able to play the fantastical thing would be part of the economy about whether or not you could actually play it. Mm. Does it make sense? sense? Does yeah, that translate? It does. Um, it does. I'm not crying poor. I'm crying. It's a unique opportunity, but like anything with that unique opportunity, no one's really figured out yet how to make it work for everybody. Right. right now, it's really only reserved for the top touring artists in the world. You are a history buff. I know this about you, and I've heard you say, you started this show saying that if you weren't a rock star, you'd be a history professor. I love that imagery, by the way. I wish like all my history professors were like goth Grammy award-winning rock stars teaching me about the fall of the Roman Empire. (laughs) I actually minored in history at the University of Florida, but I also happen to know a fun fact about you just in getting to know you over the years, and it's that you love old Hollywood, specifically the 1930s era. I'm curious, what is it about that specific era that entices you? Um, I think it's the combination of a wholly new creation because movies had been going for 20 or 30 years at that point in the silent era, and movies were quite big already. With the coming of what they call the talkies, movies for a period of time got even bigger, and you saw a revolution, and of course some of the greatest movies ever made were made in those years between, say, 1929 and 1939. And of course the advent of World War II kind of changed a lot of things, not just Hollywood. Um, So it's sort of magical, mystical, you had... You know, you literally had people like like a Judy Garland, who was already a, a known singer, sort of plucked from a form of obscurity, not complete obscurity. And next thing you know, she's starring in, you know, this all-time classic at 14 and singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's sort of something really yeah. beautiful and very American about you too yeah. can be a star, as we've seen from the various shows over the last few years. But it was the apotheosis at that time of a system of crass commercial business opportunity meeting high art citizen Kane Wells being brought in from New York as this rank on tour at 24 years old and he makes one of the greatest movies of all time there's something sort of really beautifully intriguing that that level of power money access glitz glamour uh, flesh blood sex and all of it all kind of meet in the same sort of zip code at the same time right and it was a very fecund period of, of creativity and also heartbreak and, and the stories are, are immeasurable there because it goes in 50 different directions. Leave it to you to select the era when the Great Depression happened to be like that. But that was also, sorry, but that was also part of it because right. they, they were selling people on something that was lifting their spirits. Right. And I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the amount of people going to the movies every day in America would shock you even today. And imagine that was a much smaller population. A ton of people were going to the movies every day. There was there was a real connectivity there culturally and also the dream of Hollywood and 
the dream of stardom. Gene Turney, who ended up being a great star, was literally plucked out of a touring line at back lot at Universal. Somebody saw her with her parents at 16 and literally pulled her out of the line. She became a movie star. I mean, it's like wow. crazy stuff like that. Yeah. Right? They don't make them like they used to. Well, they, they really do. Don't. They just, they just, they, they get tattoos and vape and, <laughs> and want to accomplish different things. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't believe there's less stars. I think it's just really down to how people apply themselves. Um, and when you have a social economy which rewards attention as opposed to accomplishment, well, a lot of people who could accomplish things and diverting themselves down different rabbit holes including porn because it's just it's a quicker buck right yeah they didn't have instagram in the 1930s you didn't you didn't have oh, the ability sure to had, buy I'm followers i'm sure they had a form of it i'm sure they had a form of it <laughs> i too share a love of old hollywood i mean clark gable betty davis shirley temple fred astaire i'm actually a huge Gregory Peck fan. Mm. I love one of my all time favorite movies is Roman Holiday with Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. Have you seen it? I saw Gregory Peck in person once. I think I really? told you. Really? Did I not tell you that? No, I I, you did not. Yeah, I was at a Bob Dylan show and I was kind of going up a staircase and he was going the other way. I was like, oh, like, that's like so cool. This, it's hard to explain because uh, certain people have a charisma. Mm -hmm. And obviously I recognize that it was Gregory Peck, but his charisma was like, it was that of a Hollywood star. He wow. just had that. And he was 80-something. Yeah. Had that vibe. And he still had it. Yeah. If that movie doesn't want to make you get on a Vespa and just, like, <laughs> ride through Rome. It didn't make me want to get on a Vespa. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't roll with that. You can't roll with no. Vespas? No? What about golf carts? You are in Jupiter, Florida, after all. No? No, no to golf carts? No. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, some not so depressing facts about the 1930s. 1930 was the year that the first football World Cup took place. Mickey Mouse made his first appearance in comic form. I know you're a fed fellow Disney lover, a Disney adult, as you say, enthusiast like me. Pluto was discovered as a planet. Not Isn't sure there if you know that. Though at this point, that Pluto is not a real planet. There's a debate. We're not talking about the debate. We're talking about it was discovered in 1930, and it was officially named as a planet, Pluto. And did you know that in 1938, you know everything, so it's hard for me to be like, you know, to, qu to quiz you. But the chocolate chip cookie was accidentally invented in 1938. Wow. Okay, I did not know that, and I would be surprised that because I would thought that somebody would have figured that out far sooner. Yeah. Yeah. One would think. What's so the chocolate doing? chip cookie is less than 100 years old? That's correct. Wow. So if you could pick anyone from the 1930s era from old Hollywood to have a vegan pizza with <laughs> or a tofu salad with, who would it be and why? You know, that's a really great question. I don't know if I have the answer to that. Not Gregory Peck? That would be mine. I would definitely pick a female, I think. Um, a female? Yeah. I'd have to think about who I would want to talk to. I'm a big fan of Ruby Keeler. I think that's probably, if I had to pick one, I'd probably go with Ruby Keeler. Because okay. Ruby Keeler had a very fascinating life. Um, was a was a dancer who had appeared on Broadway, um, did, danced a, a form, uh, I think it was called at the time, the buck and wing style, where you're very heavy on the heels as opposed to the toes. Can you demo that for us? I cannot. <laughs> um, but I'm sure anybody can look up a, a clip of Ruby Keeler. And, um, and Ruby Keeler came to Hollywood as many people were at that time coming off of Broadway because they needed people who could talk and sing and dance uh, for these big musicals that they were creating and uh, starred in, uh, in uh, 42nd Street, which is the classic, you know, uh, the star goes down and they got to grab the chorus girl or whatever and the show's going to go down in flames if you don't, and she has to stay up all night and learn all her lines, drinking coffee, and she goes out and she becomes a smash. And, and um and, uh, and so had a very brief, high-level career in Hollywood. Um, was married to Al Jolson uh, quite famously and was quite young at the time. And then um, retired from pictures, I think, sort of late 30s, early 40s. I spent her most of her, I guess, adultish life um, just being a parent. And, and then had a comeback, I think, in her 60s on Broadway with No, No, Nanette and had a massive mm -hmm. Broadway run. Um, and this is some beautiful about that, this idea of you're somebody, you have a gift, somebody kind of finds you, they put you into something, you have this kind of rocket moment through the heavens. It doesn't last. 
And then you have to kind of figure out what to do with that. Mm. In her case, she she made a good life of it. In many other cases, people went down in real mm. flames. So you One could say she reinvented herself. <laughs> so that's who you would share a vegan pizza with. Okay, interesting, interesting answer. I mean, there'd be so many that you could you could talk to that would be interesting. Yeah. You know. Okay, from the 1930s to the 1990s, I, the year I was Uh-oh, born. The go. year I was born, we're looking, 1990. We're looking backwards again here. Well, we go. you shared in your last interview with me, and I just wanted to dig a little deeper into this. Is seppuku really Japanese suicide? <laughs> Did I just make that up? Or harikari? I, Is seppuku, maybe it's a game. Isn't it like a word game? I don't even no, know. I'm what having. I have. Wanna, I want to Google seppuku now. Maybe. I'm yeah, you're using a lot of SAT words that I think even my viewers and listeners are going to have to be like, okay, let me. I need to Google that, Google that one. Billy is an intellect. You are a smart cookie, so that that's for sure. Um, Chocolate chip. But stop Chocolate deflecting. He's trying to deflect from me mentioning the nineties. I know where this is going. That's I know. I'm, I'm bl- I know. I'm blanching. <laughs> You said that you don't look back fondly at the 90s. And, you know, like, gosh, I wish I picked up on that when you first said it uh, in our initial interview with each other. But, you know, you have to understand from my perspective as, you know, a diehard Smashing Pumpkins fan my whole life. I mean, literally came out of the womb, like listening to Billy Corgan, the Smashing Pumpkins, if you can believe that. You know, sort of T-Rex had a line about dancing out of the womb. I might want to look that up. Go on. I'm just gir- I'm just girding myself for the for the for the boomerism just, that's coming. Warm, warm yourself up. Stretch your stretch yourself out. Right. So, sort of this outlier band full of misfits from Chicago. Who you know, you're not in Seattle, a part of like the grunge era, but you guys just do, did things differently and became so successful. What like was it this dichotomy of amazing career output versus like train wreck of a personal life. Like what is your beef with the nineties? I have to know. (laughs) (laughs) I think that the, um, let me give you, I'll give you three quick takes, three quick hot takes. And this is where you insert some, um, number one, amazing time for music. I think the music, uh, of let's call it the grunge bands has held up quite well. So a lot of classics were made, a lot of great bands, a lot of great artists. So good. So it's not all dismissive. But reflexively against that, uh, you had the onset of uh, what is now internet culture. It was just the very early version of it, where the opinions that people were holding in their brains were now spilling onto the net, starting around 1995. So we were the first generation to encounter the unchecked id spewing forth from middle America. And we weren't, you know, we socially or uh, given the way we'd been raised, we had, we had no preparation for how to deal with this, this weirdness of people crawling out of digital holes and complaining about the weirdest and most arcane stuff and competing with one another for social clout based on who could sort of irritate you the most. We did, we walked into the buzzsaw of a new culture vis-a-vis technology that we weren't prepared for. And I think, um, we didn't necessarily handle that well, but it was also the rise of a lot of kind of weird stuff that um, has ultimately over time um, been uh, an overall net negative to American culture. Um, and I'll let people do their own math and what I'm talking about because I don't want to wade into st- anything stupid. Thirdly, because of the, the inner destructive tendencies of that generation, including myself, we lost a lot of great artists who didn't go on to make that second and third wave of music that they could have and should have. And so Gen X as a sort of a group, and that was our time, was the 90s, we sort of really dropped the ball on the power that we did have, and it's never really returned. And so our story as a generation is poorly told or told as myth, not reality. And real stories of success vis-a-vis Gen X, myself included, the band included, those stories don't get told because it's people from other generations who are given the responsibility to try to tell a Gen X story, but not from the Gen X perspective, but from their their beta perspective from some other time and other culture. 
because 90s in particular, even though we saw the rise of great female rock stars, really in many ways for the first time, there were some real alpha male stars that, you know, threw their weight around and through the lens of a later culture, they're sort of uncomfortable, un uncomfortable with that level of masculinity. But that was part of the story of the times. It's like going back in the 40s and sort of trying to judge people in the way they walked. It was the way they walked at that time. So Gen X's uh, place in the culture is poorly uh, stated, uh, and, it's, and it's worthy of criticism, but most of the criticism is inaccurate because there's no one around to really write the true history of what happened. Right. Well, all right, now that we've gotten the dreaded 90s out of the way, I know, see, see that wasn't so bad. That wasn't, you survived. It's fine. Are we going to talk about Golden Girls next? <laughs> Can't no, actually. Can we talk about though the clown show that is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I don't understand their formula for inducting artist Billy because I saw that Rage Against the Machine was inducted this year, but so was Willie Nelson. And Willie Nelson's like 90 years old. It's almost like they just take some darts and like throw at them at a dartboard each year. Like how does this happen exactly? And stri speaking strictly as a bitter diehard fan, why haven't the Smashing Pumpkins yet been inducted? Number one, when I did talk about in the past, nobody cared because it ends up only kind of coming off as something to do with some form of sour grapes where even if it wasn't, that's sort of the box it gets put into. Um, it's like, well, of course you're saying that because of your situation. Um and then secondarily, I think that this goes back to the larger sort of thing that I'm talking about with you today, which is so many institutional cultures in, in American life have become so sort of kind of warped through the prism of so many things that I think most people struggle to understand sort of, uh, and I'll give, a, I'll give you a very general criticism that you hear from people, and it's sort of in, even in your criticism. It's like, why have a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame if the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame isn't only relegated to rock and roll? Yeah, that's a personally, criticism. Personally, I think Willie Nelson belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, I agree with that. Right, but what I'm saying is, is because there's no clear definition, it's confusing to people. Right. Then why didn't you just call it the Music Hall of Fame? Why is it called the Rock and Roll Hall mm, of Fame? Right. Um, and you hear those criticisms a lot from people. I, I quantify rock and roll more as a spirit thing. So does uh, 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 Public Enemy, uh, you know, the great uh, rap group from New York belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Absolutely, because it was an attitude. Pub Public Enemy was as rock and roll as, as Elvis or, or, or Rage Against the Machine, you know. So... I don't have a problem with that. I think it's just hard for people to understand sort of like the definitive qualities, especially when you start putting in pop artists who are strictly pop artists. Mm. Um, now, if the argument is, has been over time, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has morphed into an institutional culture, which is more the music Hall of Fame, then I think that would be easier for people to understand. I just feel like the overwhelming sentiment is, well, it, like if you guys were inducted, it would almost be like embarrassing for them at this point. Do you share in that sentiment? I don't. I don't presuppose to understand how people think at all anymore about anything. <laughs> Fair. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm talking at every level. Yeah. Whether you've sat at a table in the in the past ten years and had a conversation with your friends about health efficacy of of, of mass vaccination or the political process or who gets nominated to some museum to who appears on award shows or whatever, I think most people really don't either understand and or even agree commonly with what makes sense. Because there's so many agendas flying in so many different directions that there really is no longer common cause. Mm. And you see it most pointedly reflected in the ratings. Mm. The general American culture, it's hard to quantify that, is less and less and less instant interested in these institutional things because they no longer represent let's call it uh the institutional stamp of we represent this part of the world um and i how, how, what did i say to somebody recently you're asking me to give comment on something that i don't agree with it's 
it's it, on some level disagreeing with something disqualifies you from an opinion because you're already saying you don't agree. I'm just a bitter diehard. I want to write a strongly worded letter. Like, who do I direct it to? <laughs> Maybe we should start our own Hall of I, Fame. I think, I think the, <laughs> I think the, uh, the twenty-year-old uh, in me would be shocked if I could go back in a time machine. But I think that the value of the Smashing Pumpkins has grown into something which is far more valuable than um, hit records or institutional approval. Mm. Our place in musical life slash history has grown into something far more unique than even I would have imagined. So the 20-year-old in me would want the, the, the stamp of approval of all the shiny things. Right. And if you gave the big checklist on the rock and roll checklist, I mean, I've checked about every box. You so have. it's not like right. I'm lacking. And I, and I didn't understand 10 or 15 years ago if I could p- complain publicly about certain things why people would kind of come at me the way they did. And now I understand that they're, what they were saying is you should be grateful because unlike most of the people in this country or on this planet, most never even get close to the checklist to check any of the right. boxes. You check most of the boxes. Right. So I really moved on that to a place of gratitude. Like I feel very grateful that we've gotten as much as we've gotten uh, out of the process and continue to. So there's no kind of bitterness in that. Any bitterness I have is more relegated to my own relationship to those institutions, the way I've been treated by the music business, the way I've been treated by music media. Yeah. You know, because it kind of falls into what my kid would call unfair. Right. And there's been an unfairness there. Right. But separating out everything that I'm talking to you about, if you just look at the journey of the Smashing Pumpkins as a musical group and our own form of an institution, <laughs> and I use that word liberally both ways, we've done quite well in, in, in generating and creating something which is wholly unique. And for those who enjoy what we do, they have a special relationship to it that is far more valuable and more akin to people's relationships to say the who or the grateful dead or the cure or the kinks or artists like that than whether or not the agreed upon five hit songs are as good as the other bands agreed upon five hit songs. Agreed. It's more about the way we rolled, I think at this point. And I think, and continue to roll. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say in a form of code is that will be the real story on the band. So if a Broadway play ever gets made, a movie ever gets made on my life, anybody ever reads the book about my life, it'll be because people are interested in that story, not the pre-approved, did you get on MTV? Did you go out with the model? Right. Did she break your heart? Right. You know, did you find love in the garden and all this kind of stuff that the Hollywood version of it all puts upon us and used to put on us. And it actually did mean something. It actually sold records back in the day. It sold magazines. Now, I don't know what sells records or magazines because if anybody had figured it out, they would be selling records and magazines. That's true. That's true. I agree with that. Uh, You know, I went to your show in West Palm Beach, Florida last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you played Hummer, that was like, you were giving me like such a treat. It was like a morsel. And we all, uh, everyone around us wanted more. I was like floating on a cloud. And it felt like no one else was at the concert venue with me, except for about 100 smelly, sweaty, shirtless NWA wrestlers <laughs> surrounding me. Literally, it was like you on stage and Joe Galley and Kyle Davis saw me and like pulled me over the metal bar. I was, I, I thought I had pretty good seats to your show, but apparently not NWA wrestler seats. Pulled me over the metal bar and I was with two friends of mine at the time and they just saw me get engulfed in a sea of wrestlers. It was just a sea of NWA and Jen. And my fr- I looked over at my friend, Josh. He's like, how do you know so many NWA yes. wrestlers? I said, I don't, I don't. Yes. Anyway, I'd be crazy not to ask you about the NWA, given there is a lot of wrestling fans who oddly enough tune in. Can you give us any updates? Can you share any news? Uh, we're going to debut exclusively on the CW uh, streaming platform starting February 6th. And then we're still waiting for a delivery date on the um, the unscripted show. <gasps> I love it. February 6th on the CW. Which will also appear on the CW. 
Um, so we have a lot of that coming. And then, as usual, we're just trying to do what any kind of, you know, homespun con- uh, company does, which is just continue to grow and prosper. We just did a show in Fort Lauderdale, and we did a show in uh, uh, TV taping in Tampa. So um, lots always going on with the NWA, which is, for those who don't know, it's the oldest professional wrestling organization in the world, 75 plus years and counting. 19, what does your sweater say? 1940. Yeah, established wow. in 1948, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, and then I think within one year, the NWA was sued for antitrust by the U.S. government. Mm. You're doing like a juggling act. If you don't own a vegan tea shop in Highland Park, Illinois, you own a wrestling company. Yes. If you don't own a wrestling company, you're selling out tours worldwide. Like, what is your end game with, <laughs> what is your end, I don't want to say end game. No, no, but it's it's the perfect word. <laughs> well, I don't want to say end game as it relates to NWA because you have taken it to such great heights and I, it's like so many good things are happening with the league. Like, what is your, I guess, what is your motive right now? You're Where do you see it going? For wrestling or For wrestling, for NWA. <clears throat> uh, I do believe that, uh, as an organization, we have an opportunity to become one of the top promotions, uh, not only in America, but in the world. That requires a lot of ifs, and I'm not a big fan of if this happens, and if this happens, and if this happens, well, then this other magical thing's going to happen. But I do think you have to set yourself up for the opportunities of success. So I've tried to organize it that way. At some point, someone else in this world with um, money and or access to larger media will need to look at what um, I've rebuilt of course, with the help of many others, and see that that opportunity has a lot of um, upside to it. Um, I don't have the personal gravitas or or finances to take it to that other level and that other level. So much like a band trying to get a record deal, we're sort of properly positioned, but at some point we'll need somebody to come along and say, okay, there's a lot of money in what you've kind of positioned here. Um, and so I can only operate sort of optimistically on, am I creating something that has value and uh, has an upper value, and I'm not sure how long I can do it, but I'm going to try to do it as long as I can to see if it can work. Um, Otherwise, if you deal in the other economy, well, uh, it's an independent organization that is able of generating attention and energy, and you should just focus on that. And then maybe some magical thing will happen along the way, but you don't really think about it that way. It's not the way my brain operates. I'm I'm all in to the extent that you either go for the you either try to run the table or you get out. Right. So soliciting for a guitarist and perhaps soliciting potential investors. Triangle player in the... Triangle in the player. Room. Cowbell. Don't uh, forget the cowbell. I have, not, I have not gone to market for investors yet. I'm, I've not reached that point. Because um, okay. that involves a set of dynamics I'm not prepared to deal with. So for now, I continue to sort of try to properly position. And okay. of course, with these two network opportunities with the CW for 2024, we'll see what changes all chemically within the organization and also externally. Um, Because it's such a social organization in terms of reactive with the fans and also the talent that come in and out of the organization, it's not a fixed thing like, hey, Billy, are you going to put out a Pumpkins record? Do you want to go in the studio? Can you be done like this? It relies on a lot of other factors that I don't have control over. Is there anything you can tell us about the unscripted show? Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's almost locked. Um, it balances my life in wrestling against my, my life. Um, the life that most people would assume, whether it's, um, the tea house, my, my family, um, and of course my life in the pumpkins. I love it. It's hard to give percentages on that. It's very much a show about wrestling. Right. But it contrasts my life in wrestling with why would you even, if you do all this other crazy cool stuff, right. why would you bother with wrestling? That's always the existential question, and it remains the existential question with myself. Um, I was up this morning at 7 a.m. working on Smashing Pumpkins music. That takes enough of my time and enough of my energy, and if that's all I did, you would say that's more than enough to try to put wrestling on top of it and all the issues that come up with trying to run a professional wrestling organization. It's, it's a lot. It's Well, it's too much. It's a it's lot. It's absolutely too much. Um, so the existential question, and I think that's what people will find interesting if they watch the series, and the indications are that when the series goes up, it'll be put up so people want to binge watch it. Um, it's eight episodes, so an hour each. Um, and, of course, I've seen them all and participated in all, and... and but I think what's interesting, and of course we're, I'm tooting our horn here, is 
it's a rare insight not only into how the professional wrestling business works, warts and all, it's also very critical of me in the show. Wow. Because that helps set up the existential argument of if you're being criticized and things don't always go the way you want over here in the magical world of wrestling, right. then you contrast it with this beautiful wife, beautiful life, magical run in the band. Mm -hmm. And this period of the band is the biggest period we've had in yeah. over 20 years. Absolutely. Why would you? Because that's the common question that anybody would ask. And I, it wouldn't matter what the dynamics were. If right. somebody owned a successful car dealership and they wanted to become a, you know, I don't know, a, uh, a rock star, a semi -pro no, a semi-professional hockey player. And it was okay. a contrast between, right. Hey, you're super successful, but why are you but putting, why, why are you playing hockey at 45? Or right. Something? The dynamics are the same. You have to set up the existential question. And the show does a really good job of getting to the heart of that question, which is why would somebody with your life as magical as it is and as celebrated as it is, particularly at this point in your life, why would you bother with this other thing? And, and the beautiful thing is I can't really always answer that question. I can answer it in specifics, but in general, even at this point at 56, about to turn 57, I can't sit here and tell you I know why other than I'm drawn to this thing. And whether it's addiction or it's stupidity or it's a love of something or all <laughs> of the above or a true business opportunity, that question is po posed in the show. And we try to answer that question because that's what makes the show interesting. That's beautiful. I can't wait to watch that. I will be one of those bingers, by the way. All right. Well, sweaty wrestlers seems like a good time to transition to get out, yeah. into a quick rapid fire round. Oh, Are go. you ready? Okay. Strap in. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I put a lot of thought into these, by the way. All right. So, all right. Drawn and quartered or death by firing squad? <laughs> firing squad. Is there a reason? Or? Do I have to give a reason? I thought this was a rapid fire. This is my show. Sometimes I can ask you to elaborate on something. No reason? Just quicker? <laughs> <laughs> Less well, painful. Drawn, actually, I read the, 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 the memoirs of Casanova. And in it, he describes watching someone being drawn and quartered Oof. in Paris during the, uh, you know, the, the terrors mm -hmm. of the, the Jacobins or whatever. Um, it doesn't sound like a fun time. Yeah. Because you live after your limbs are ripped off. Yeah. No, that's that's not. So. Uh, not just, the way I'd go. If you want to go deep now, let's just go <laughs> into this. You're laying there. Um, you're laying there without your limbs. Right. And. I'm assuming there's a lot of pain going on <laughs> right? and you're bleeding to death and people are laughing at you. Right. Doesn't seem no, like a doesn't good, doesn't seem like a good way to go. Party, no. you know? Yeah. No, As I opposed get it. to, you want the blindfold? You don't want the blindfold ready, right. aim, fire. It's done. Over done. Yeah. Okay. Respect. Uh, if you were a vegetable, which one would you be? Green bean. Green <laughs> bean. That was like the last vegetable I would think of that you would that you would select. Interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, what is your spirit animal and why? Green bean. <laughs> your spirit. Okay. Spirit animal. Talking about a vegetable. We're now transitioning to animals. Elephant. And why would you pick elephant? That's interesting. You're the elephant in the room. Th because of the elephant in the room? Because you're the elephant in the room. I'm the elephant in the room. Okay, interesting. Okay, I'll, t I'll take it. What is the strangest talent you possess? I'm actually not that talented. At <laughs> you're like, I'm just talented in general. No, I'm saying <laughs> I, 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 guitar came easy and words have always come easy. Other than that, I'm kind of a, you know, like they say, idiot savant. It's just, I'm just an idiot. So... Strange talent, no strange talent you can think of. Can I share mine? Maybe it'll, sure. maybe it'll inspire maybe you. It'll inspire me. So, um, never shared this before. This is actually humiliating. Right. So, I can pick things up with my feet like really well because I have long like toes. I have like not cute feet, which is strange because I'm actually on wiki feet. 
that's like a thing with like I heard about that the other yeah, day. Yeah, for like celebs, like hot girls, like there's a, some creep out there who I guess has a foot fetish and uploads feet pictures on I can't Wiki say feet. I've seen your feet, so I, I no, can't No, and can't I'm wearing to, like I can't speak to your feet. Platform combat boots um, right now. But I have these like long toes. So like, I'm like, like a sim- monkey. Like simian. Like yeah, simian. Like quality. if you had like a five pound weight on the floor, I could probably pick it up with my toes. We're not going to demo that right now, but maybe, maybe, in, huh. maybe a different show. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I have any talents. Wow. Okay. All right, man. What is the funniest prank you've pulled on someone or had pulled on you? Could go either way with this. The funniest prank. I'm not a prank person. You're not a prankster? I think pranks are generally cruel. I should like run these rapid fire rounds by you before we do them to make yeah. sure that you'll have an answer. <laughs> this is I mean, this I've, is what I've, I get for coming I've in. I've heard of other great pranks, but I, I can't I can't think of one prank I've ever um really participated in. Anything done to you? Oh yeah, I mean I've definitely been pranked, but nothing I would want to remember. Oh. Okay. All right. Fair enough. This is such a vibe killer. This yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It, no, we're going to let it rip. We're going to leave all the awkwardness, all the silence, everything in here. Uh, there's a conspiracy theory floating around about you that you are a part, like you follow Masonic teachings. Mm, are yeah. you a Freemason? Is there any truth to that? Um, what can you share with us about uh, that? I'm not a Mason. I have been invited to join a few since people started this uh, idea that I am a Mason, um, uh, never applied to be a Mason, um, don't have any particular interest other in, than in the history of, of Masons. I did find out uh, in the last few years that my family is OG Mason, and, um, wow. and there's a lot of connections there, um, which maybe might explain my interest in Mason iconography, but mm. besides that, no, I mean, I think it's, it's fine like anything else, and I think the Masons have a lot to do with America and the founding of America and stuff like that. So general respect there, but no, it's not, not a particular interest to me. I, I just find it fascinating that, that, you know, um, uh, like we had this issue recently with the NWA where we did a spot where um, we had a, a character who plays a devil, uh, the sinister minister, Jim <laughs> Mitchell. Uh, we had him do a spot where he, uh, uh, snorted uh, sugar off a table or something. Oh, I remember that. And 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 the wrestling internet culture turned it into this big, huge controversy. Right. That was yeah. And acted, and they started because because cl- you know no one can take a joke today. Well, no, because they were clutching their pearls and saying, "Oh, this is so awful." Meanwhile, you got people carving themselves up with light tubes, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. People bleeding, fine. People uh, saying they'll kill each other is fine. People saying they're gonna cause each other grievous bodily harm and um, make it so they can no longer do their job. Totally fine in wrestling culture. Right. But a character, a fake character, by the way, playing the devil. Snorting um, who's sugar. Who's snorting sugar off a table. Oh, my God. You, you, you Call would, the police. You would have thought uh, right. you know, Mother, Ter- Mother Teresa had come down from the heavens to yeah. condemn us all. So, um, Well, while we're on the topic of Satan snorting sugar... Mm. How's that for a segue? Yeah. Uh, are you a part of any satanic fraternal organizations? Because no, no. that's another conspiracy theory. I feel like it, I feel like at some point I either met Anton LaVey or I met somebody from the ch- Church of Satanists that was run by Anton LaVey out of San Francisco. There's that's some murky memory there where I end up talking to somebody from that world, but I, I never had any interest. Okay. When I think of the Illuminati... I think Billy. How do we get from vegetables to Illuminati? This is the show. You got to just roll with it. You got to roll with it. I still can't get over the fact that you identify as a green bean, but whatever. We'll we'll let that slide. When I think of the Illuminati, I think like Elon Musk, Billy Corgan, and like Howard Stern, like all sitting in a room. (laughs) That's quite a combination. Are you saying that you're saying that? (laughs) Th- those other people are a part of the Illuminati? No, I just is, I'm asking you, first of all, I asked the questions, is the Illuminati real? Yes or no? Um, as it's commonly defined in culture, no. But as it, in terms of the spirit of the question, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, say the word. Like, like, is there a club called that? Not really. But is there a club? Yes. 
Okay. A group of powerful individuals. I think there's many who, groups. Yeah. Agreed. And is there a group, like the group? Um, sort of. And it's safe to say you aren't a part of the group? No, no. I mean, I, I wish somebody would offer me something in this world <laughs> other than a hard time. <laughs> All right. Say, oh, this one I'm excited for. Say the word bubbles angry. Bubbles. <laughs> That was good. That was good. Give give us one more. Give us no, like no, one you more. Got, you, one we take. got it. Okay, fine. All right. If you were a professional wrestler and you didn't own a wrestling organization, what would your stage name and signature move be? Uh, I would be Jennifer uh, Von oh, Eckhart. Stop. Jennifer Von Eckhart, <laughs> a uh, an East German, uh, uh, a former East German swimmer. Uh, who was on a lot of steroids and had a mustache, and um, and, and and the signature move would be the, uh, the the vice leg lock. The vice leg lock. Yeah, as in once you're within her her East German leg lock, you can never escape. This is the polar opposite of what I was expecting you to say. By the way, he's giving me a hard time because I found out that my last name used to have Vaughn in front of it somewhere along. Isn't that our- a good wrestling name? Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, Jennifer Von Eckhart. Uh, well, it's it's kind of my name. But, but isn't that a good wrestling name? Um, better sure. Than, better than Billy, Bill Corgan. Sure, Billy Corgan. Yeah, it, it could be. Uh, I'm disappointed you didn't say your move would be the Smashing Pumpkin. Wouldn't that make sense? Is that too predictable? Too predictable. Uh, I think the term is on the nose. <laughs> okay. Is smashing in the Smashing Pumpkins an adjective? It's the English use of the word. Uh, I I don't that that's a, does that I don't think that answers. Brilliant, my smashing, Brilliant. fantastic. Oh okay. Have you ever smashed a pumpkin? Have not. Wait a second. You're in a. Have ba- I been asked this question? Yeah. A lot I know times. you've been asked this, but you uh, you haven't been asked it by me. Okay. And probably not recently. Of course, your audience only listens to you, and no one else. <laughs> <laughs> so. So you're in a band called the Smashing Pumpkins, and you've never smashed a pumpkin, not once. No. Wow. Yes, I did feel, though, however, that it was appropriate to end this interview honoring Lisa Marie Presley, uh, yeah. your dear friend. Now it I was. I got to get serious. I know. I'm sorry. Shifting from sweaty, res- sweaty wrestlers and green beans and the Illuminati to now your dear friend. It was the one year anniversary since Lisa Marie Presley's untimely passing. You were friends with. Elvis's daughter, and even sang at Graceland uh, at her funeral. Yeah. Are you able to share, like, what is your favorite memory with Lisa Marie? Um, we did a lot of things together and spent a lot of time together um, in one particular period of our life, but we, we, we remain friends. Um, I think without being specific to any one thing, I think my favorite uh, memory of her is that I was given access to her as a person meaning that for somebody who grew up famous from the day they were born and grew up with all the public pressure of people's expectations, that she was able with me and a few other friends to just be herself. Mm. And in that, uh, you got to see not only glimpses of what made her special, but also what made Elvis so special. It's a certain type of charm uh, that runs in the family and a certain dynamism and charisma and of course beauty too and being up close to that and having access to that let's call it as part of a greater american fable because elvis really is you could argue maybe the greatest american fable of all time a lot of people ask me if i saw the recent movie that came out and i said i'm not interested because i wasn't interested in a mythological take of an already mythological life mm. i think elvis's life as is is fascinating enough. I don't think it needed embellishment. Um, so, again, speaking personally, being behind the wall of that world, however briefly here and there, knowing her, the person, her, the mother, the friend, and really uh, cherishing uh, that is is something that's really bittersweet because there's a lot of beautiful memories there, and uh, and I'm happy to speak on her behalf. Um, and I'm interested because there's a memoir about to come out and um, I didn't know that one was being written. So we'll see what that says. And maybe that'll be hopefully an honest reflection of, of her life. 
but also, you know, being in, in, in her own magical way, being given a little few keys to the Elvis's kingdom to understand what makes he is a creative and uh, cultural institutional figure. Um, having sort of a front row seat to that, I think, is something that's really valuable to him. Yeah. I, I want to read really quickly what an anonymous soul shared on our past YouTube interview together. He wrote, or she, we don't know who this person is. On Saturday, I was walking around Graceland, and when I got to the parking lot, I looked over, and there was Billy Corgan. I knew it was him, but didn't approach him. It felt like he didn't need me, a stranger, coming up to him in that moment. He was just a man spending time at Graceland in the wake of the loss of Lisa Marie. At the time, I did not know he was a friend of hers. He sang beautifully for her at the funeral on Sunday morning. That had to have been such a difficult thing for him to do, sending him love and hoping he continues to be exactly who he is, an incredibly humble and gifted resident of planet Earth. Oh, that's nice. And I couldn't agree more. Billy, thank you for being who you are as a living embodiment of someone who has reinvented themselves both as a person, as a father, as an artist. Thank you for stopping by the show today for a part two sit down. I mean, the final sit down. The final sit down. <laughs> We're not going to do a part three or a part four. There will have to be a lot of ground rules. A part five. A part. He doesn't like the rapid fire. Okay. Or the 90s. Hey, listen, if the Las Vegas sphere doesn't work out, you always have a residency here on the Reinvented Podcast. <laughs> all right. To all my viewers and listeners, be sure to... Re- peace out to all my viewers and listeners be sure to rate review and subscribe to reinvent it with jen eckhart that's available wherever you get your podcasts spotify apple youtube iHeartRadio, you name it it's there i'm jen eckhart that was billy corgan thank you for listening 